Lord. Happy Easter, happy Resurrection Day. Amen. Glory to God. Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. We're going to sing that in a minute. Hallelujah. Jesus is alive. We celebrate that today. We celebrate it every day, actually, but glory to God. I hope you came expecting, you know, if we come with an expectation, we come not with an arrogance, but like, oh, God, you owe this to me. But if we come and say, Lord, I know that you know what's best for me and you just want to minister in my life. If you just open your heart and your mind and let him do that, he wants to do that. So I, I encourage um, anybody and everybody to just open your heart and let the Lord minister. Let his presence that fills this place speak to your heart today. So let's get ready to worship the Lord. Lord, I just thank you today for your presence. I thank you, Lord, that we have your resurrection to celebrate, that we serve a living God, that you aren't just a statue, you're not a picture on the wall. You're alive, Lord, and you're working in, in our lives. And Lord, we serve a living God who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could even think or ask. Lord, you surpass our understanding, you surpass human knowledge, and you surpass human might and strength. And Lord, today I pray as we're about to worship you that your presence would fill this place, that you would minister to our minds, our hearts, and our bodies, Lord. And today, Lord, you are who makes a difference in all of our lives. Make that difference today, touching people, touching lives. And Lord, we'll just give you the praise, the honor, and the glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Let's worship the Lord together. Hallelujah. Jesus is alive. And
praise your name, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
the Lamb. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, Lord. We worship you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. We praise your name.
Hallelujah, 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 Lord, we were in Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the 
praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. as we have worshipped you. As the psalmist said, O thou that inhabitest the praises of his people. You, Lord, once again have inhabited the praises of your people. You are here, Lord, in your precious presence is moving about in this place. I pray, Lord Jesus, as you are here, Lord, and as you move, Lord, that you are touching lives changing our lives to be more like you, strengthening, encouraging, Lord. Lord, I pray today for every sickness and every infirmity, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray, Lord, that your healing virtue would fall fresh in this place, Lord. Lord Jesus, I pray, Lord, that you would touch lives, bring healing, Lord, for every person here, Lord, that needs a touch from heaven, make them whole, Lord, from the top of their head to the very soles of their feet. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name for miracles, miracle healings that only you can do. Our God, who is an awesome God, Lord, I pray today, Lord, as sure as you're in this place, Your healing virtue, Lord, would flow. Lord, I pray your power would make new, Lord. Lord, would touch and, Lord, strengthen and encourage. Lord, for those that might be down, Lord, faced with challenges and trials and circumstances, I pray, Lord, that you reach down, Lord, pull them up into your arms, Lord, into the safety and the security and the love of your arm. Lord, I pray today, Lord, for those that might be feeling anxious about tomorrow's uncertainty. Lord, I pray today would be a day where, Lord, your peace that passes all understanding, Lord, would fall upon them. Lord, I pray, Lord, for those that have other needs, Lord, maybe it's financial. Maybe there's something on their mind, Lord, that just they can't just get it out of their head. And Lord, I pray today, Lord, Lord, that you would give strength to the weary, Lord. And Lord, you would encourage those that are down. You would lift up those, Lord, and let them know that Jesus loves them, that Jesus is alive. You're alive, Lord, and you are moving and you are touching lives. Change us to be more like you, Lord, today. Lord, as we celebrate your resurrection, Lord, to know that we serve a risen Savior who conquered death. For there's nothing that you haven't already conquered, Lord. Lord, I thank you and praise you today for all that you're doing, for all the lives that you're speaking into and touching. Lord, we just give you praise today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. If you're not seated, you can be seated as we continue to worship in uh, communion. If you prepare your hearts to receive, there's cups on here for those that need the uh, gluten-free, the juice is gluten-free, but the The bread is not, so if you need gluten-free, we have a couple of cups there. 
go ahead and pass those. Watch that. Hallelujah. There's a place where mercy reigns and never that you pay. I pray, Lord, that our hearts are clean from your blood, Lord, as you shed. Lord, that you would forgive us for any ought or any sin that we have in our lives. That our hearts would be prepared in a worthy fashion to accept and take 
communion today, Lord. Lord, it only can be done that way through your blood that was shed on Calvary. Lord, I pray today as we have this symbol of your body that was broken for us, your body that was torn, Lord, for each and every person, for those who will believe in you, Lord, for those who will choose to follow you. Lord, today we offer this as a remembrance, and we do it in remembrance of you and the price in the pain and excruciating pain that you felt, Lord. We pray that you bless this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. You may eat then. Hallelujah. Lord, for your blood that is shed, your scripture tells us that there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. And that the blood of goats and rams and bulls could not sufficiently provide for the forgiveness of sins. And Lord, you went to the cross. Lord, and you shed your blood. And today, Lord, as we do this in remembrance of you, I pray a blessing on this symbol of your blood, Lord, that you shed, that we might be righteous in, in the face of our Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would clean us white as snow and wash. Lord, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You may drink it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let's sing that at the cross, at the cross again. Hallelujah. At the cross, at the cross, at the cross. We continue to worship the Lord in our giving. Lord, I thank you today for your provision, for your blessing, Lord. And I pray as your people give to you, Lord, I pray that you would bless them, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Lord, I pray today, Lord, your blessing would come upon them. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Glory to God. God said his son.
Glory to God. <coughs> Thank you, worship team. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Happy Easter and Resurrection Day. Amen. What a beautiful day to celebrate. Glory to God. Today I want to talk about how Christ's resurrection is our hope for today. And I want to make it practical to our lives. To be honest with you, I don't know if I preached this sermon similarly last year. But when I felt or I thought in myself that I was going to look back and see if I had preached this, I heard the Lord specifically say to me, I don't care if you preached it last year, I want you to preach it. And you know it's not going to be the same anyways. So you know me, I had to say, okay, well, you know, and I had that temptation again to look back and see if I preached it again because I save all my sermons in the computer. And the Lord said again, I don't care if you pre preached that last year, I want you to preach it. So... Let's hear what the Lord has to say to us. Let, I'm going to turn to 1 Corinthians 15.1. And Paul is speaking to the Corinthians here. And I want us to, uh, it's kind of going to be a journey like the disciples for the few, next few moments. Yes, famous last words from the minister, a few moments, you know. The Bible says a day's like a thousand years, so. What's a few moments in God's time? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 says, Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believed something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important and what had to be passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day. Just as the scripture said, he was seen by Peter and then by twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive. Well, that doesn't apply today. They're not still alive today. Though some have died, just Jesus, he's still alive. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. For I am the least of all the prophets. In fact, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. But whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out his special favor on me and not without results. For I have worked harder than any of the other apostles, yet it was not I but God who was working through me by his grace. So it makes no difference whether I preach or they preach, for we all preach the same message you have already believed. But tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there is still will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless. And your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of the great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came to the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has become, begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given a new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest, then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. After that, the end will come. 
when he will turn the kingdom over to God, the Father, having destroyed every ruler and the authority and power. Lord, I thank you today for your powerful word. I thank you today for your precious yet powerful presence here in this place. I thank you, Lord, that you have spoken to us. Now I pray as I deliver your message, it would be yours and not mine. I pray that you would hide me behind the cross and the words that I speak would be your words, Lord. And I give you praise and thank you for it. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. You know, we spent almost uh, nearly a year on a series, Press On, that God is with us. And one of the messages of a two-message series by Pastor Chuck Swindoll, he asked, what one word would you describe Jesus? Amazing? Compassionate, faithful, forgiving, life-giving, loving. The word he chose was fascinating, and I love this statement he made because this really is the essence of press on that God is with us. Jesus did the unpredictable to accomplish the incredible. Jesus did the unpredictable to accomplish the incredible. The series we did, Press On, that God is with us, significantly focused on pressing on because just because the Lord does the unpredictable to accomplish the incredible for his glory, that the spread of his gospel might be spread throughout the world. He's willing that none should perish, no one should die and be condemned to hell. His miracles, his signs and wonders were intended to draw in unbelievers and to raise the faith of the believers, to teach us to walk by our faith in him, completely trusting him, and not walking in our life by the view of our own human eyes and understanding, but walking by the faith in Jesus and having him be our eyes and understanding. We spent months, nearly a year, examining examples in the scripture of God doing the unpredictable and accomplishing the incredible. It was unpredictable to come to the sea and have the Egyptians coming at you and thinking that sheer destruction was at hand. And God tells Moses, just go stretch your arms and stretch the uh, the sea, open the sea. Because that's how we do things. You open a sea. You know, when you need to pass through, you just stretch your arms. That's what happens, right? That's predictable. That's what usually happens. So don't take the bridge on the way home. On your way home, Go by the canal. That's what just happens, right? That's predictable. But we went through example and example and example after example of of how God did so many uh, amazing things and how those unpredictable things accomplished incredible things. Many of the seemingly impossible situations that he did they defied the, uh, the normal course of events in human reasoning. It just didn't make sense. What God was doing did not make sense. And we look at today, I want us to apply everything that I'm saying today to lives. That, if we can't apply it to our life, then it doesn't mean anything. So I want us to apply that this today, this message, to our lives in a practical manner. Probably the most significant example for us are the events of Christ dying on the cross and raising from the dead to provide us a hope in a world that's spiraling in uncertainty, decay, and evil. There's one of the most significant examples of the unpredictable and the incredible is Jesus dying on the cross and raising from the dead because that just didn't happen. I mean, people died, were crucified, criminals. But raising from the dead, walking out from a sealed tomb, that just didn't happen. Let's take this journey with the disciples for a moment. If we were one of the disciples or followers of Jesus during that day, we might have asked ourselves this question, point number one, if you're taking notes, why did he have to die? I want you to think about this, keep this in mind, because I'll give it to you, but 
keep in mind, the disciples walked with him, talked with him, friends, relationship, I'll say that again, but bear that in your mind. So now, we know though today, because we have the scripture to tell us today, the New Testament, Hebrews 9, 22 tells us that there's no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. We also know in Hebrews 10, 4, it tells us that it wasn't possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So to finish the work and fulfill the scripture, Jesus came to be the ultimate sacrifice to fulfill the scripture and to be the lamb that was slain, the perfect lamb. To end all sacrifices. And I say this every time I preach something about this. Aren't you glad we aren't doing sacrifices anymore? What a bloody mess it would be. I can't even imagine. I've told you before, Joyce Myers says she gets tired just thinking about it. All of the things, the processes they had to do. The prophet Isaiah, he foretold Christ's events and the the events surrounding Christ. But let's put ourselves in the disciples' shoes now for a moment and apply it to our own lives and things that might be happening to us. In Matthew 17, 22, Jesus said this to the disciples. After they gathered again in Galilee, Jesus told them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of his enemies, He will be killed, but on the third day he will be raised from the dead. And the disciples were filled with grief. Receive that. Take that. Think about that for a moment. Some speculate that the disciples were so struck by Christ telling them he was going to be killed that they didn't even absorb what he was saying. And they didn't even hear him say that he would be raised from the dead. You know, sometimes when we're shocked by something we are told or witnessed, we fixate on processing that information, and we lose, we're no longer hear or observe what's happening around us. I think they call that disassociation nowadays. They may have, there's speculation, I'm not making a doctrine on it, it's not going to take you to heaven or not, but there is speculation that they may have disassociated and not even heard him say, I'm going to raise from the dead, because he said to them, hey, in a little while, I'm going to be killed. Think about that for a moment. Somebody tells you that. Somebody you've walked with, you've talked with, you've friends with, he's taught you. Rabbi, they call them, teacher. He's done miracles. Even in Mark Uh, Chapter 9, verse 31, for he wanted to spend more time with his disciples and teach them. He said to them, Son of man is going to be betrayed. This is a different account by Mark of the same thing. And each each time uh, there's a different account, sometimes we get little tidbits that weren't in the other one. The Son of man is going to be betrayed into the hands of his enemies. He will be killed, but three days later he will rise from the dead. Verse 32, they didn't understand what he was saying. However, They were afraid to ask him what he meant. That's odd. Because they usually were like, whoa, Jesus, what what do you mean? Sometimes I I tell you I feel like one of them. When the Lord says something and I'm like, well, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, as humans, we're a little thick sometimes. It takes a little bit to sink in, doesn't it? And sometimes, you know, God's trying to do something and we're just not seeing it yet. And he's like, won't you just get it already? You know, like the guy that's on the housetop, I've told you numerous times, he's waiting. The Lord said he would send somebody and the floodwaters are raising. And the Lord sent a helicopter and he said, no, I'm waiting for the Lord. The Lord sent a boat, no, I'm waiting for the Lord. He died and went to heaven. He said to the Lord, Lord, I thought you said you were going to save me. He said, I sent you a boat and a helicopter. What more did you want? He just didn't get it. Sometimes we just don't get it either. They didn't understand what he was saying. Jesus had performed miracles. Jesus was their teacher and he taught them the scriptures and challenged their thinking. 
But much like humans in the world today, they regarded Christ more for what he accomplished on earth than what he was here to accomplish for eternity. They had a relationship with him. They had a bond with him. They were friends. But he was their teacher. He was their mentor. He was their life. They were following him. And now he says, I'm going to die. And he wasn't that old. They're going to kill me. They're gonna be, I'm going to be betrayed, and they're going to kill me. What are we thinking? I want you to think about that for a moment. Apply that in our own lives. Further, they thought that he was the Messiah to restore the earthly kingdom. They thought Jesus came to restore Israel to their power and prominence again. In fact, in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, so when the apostles were with Jesus, Jesus kept that, or they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? When Jesus was telling them about being baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit and that he would be ascending, or they said, oh, is this it? Is this the time? Is this when you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They're, they were thinking that he had come and it, he was going to restore the nation, earthly nation of Israel. So on top of their friend, their mentor, their teacher, Their hope of the restoration, he says he's going to die, he's going to be killed. In spite of Christ's influence in them, in the time he spent with them, they failed to see the true picture, to fully grasp the plan and the will of God. Their teacher, their friend, their mentor was now going to be killed, taking with him to the grave all their hopes for themselves and their nation. Can we think about that for a moment in our own lives, in our own situations? Maybe not that drastic, but maybe there are situations that drastic. And we apply this to our lives. What is it that shakes our faith and complete trust in Jesus about eternity? Not only to forgive our sins, but for us to know that he's working it all out for ours and his own good. That he would receive the glory and that all things work together for good and you always hear me say, good is defined by him, not us. Because his good is much better than our good. His good is defined much better than ours. The second point, it gets worse before it gets better. You ever had that happen? It, it gets worse before it gets better. You know, when a storm comes, it starts, you see it coming, and the wind is blowing a little bit, and maybe a little bit of rain. And then the intensity picks up and it gets worse before it gets better. In Luke chapter 23, verse 44, by this time it was about noon and darkness fell across the whole land until 3 o'clock. The light from the sun was gone and suddenly the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down. In the middle, sorry, was torn down in the middle. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. When the Roman officer overseeing the execution saw what had happened, he worshiped God and said, surely this man was innocent. And when all the crowd that came to see cru the crucifixion saw what happened, they went home in deep sorrow. And then in Mark 4, 15, 42, so then what did they do? This all happened on Friday the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath, as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea took a risk and went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Joseph was an honored member of the high council and he was waiting for the kingdom of God to come. Pilate couldn't believe that Jesus was already dead, so he called for the Roman officer and asked if he had died yet. The officer confirmed that Jesus was dead, so Pilate told Joseph he could take the body. Joseph bought a long sheet of linen cloth, then he took Jesus' body down from the cross, wrapped it in the cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been carved out on the rock, of the rock. Then he rolled the stone in front of the entrance. Mary Magdalene and Mary 
the mother of Joseph, was where Jesus' body was laid. It's interesting, remember in the scriptures, uh, it tells us that they wanted to make sure they sealed it. Because, you know, he, he said he was going to rise again, so they might steal his body. Or just in case he rises, just like he said, well, well the stone might keep him in. So what the, had filled the disciples with grief has now filled them with deep sorrow. Because Jesus said, I'm going to be killed and betrayed. And it's happened. It's happened. The unthinkable has now come to pass. Jesus, our Messiah, our teacher, our friend, our mentor, our hope of restoring Israel is now dead. He's buried and the tomb is sealed. How can this be? He did nothing wrong. Jesus didn't deserve this. The criminals were on the cross and they were being punished for doing sin. They deserved it. He didn't deserve it. It's not right. How can this be? He's an innocent man. They shouldn't, why is he being killed? Then the thought was, wait a minute, they knew we were with him, what now for us? What's going to happen to us now? It looked like the end of the story, the dead end, with all their hope dying in the body of Jesus being placed in the tomb. If we place this in perspective in our own lives, think about it for a moment. Our trials, our struggles that take place in our lives and all we can see in our human eyes is the destruction of our hope. Because what we believe is the plan or or what we've invented to be the plan has now been dashed down. All of our hopes and dreams are all dashed away. They thought they're all going to the grave with Jesus. Sealed in that tomb. Now what do we do? Peter says, why don't I go fishing? So I wouldn't be going fishing. I would just say I'm going on the boat. Because you know me, I don't, I wouldn't get any consolation and and I wouldn't get any um, rest from fishing because I would get agitated that I never caught anything. So I would just go on the boat. I wouldn't go fishing. But Peter said, I think I'm going to go back to fishing. Put this in perspective. You know, what is it in our lives that shakes our confidence in the Lord? Think about them that all of this is like the world. Our world as we know it is no longer going to be the way it is. Hmm, does that sound familiar? Their world as they knew it, the man that had showed them so much, taught them so much, had loved on them so much, just hung there on a cross, brutally beaten, and now he's in a tomb somewhere, dead. And the little phrase that said he would raise from in three days was forgotten. But it wasn't the end of the story. Somebody say amen. It's not the end of the story. There's a song, right? There's a song for everything in the scripture. In Luke 24, verse 5, the women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. The men asked why you're looking among the dead for someone who is alive. He isn't here. He's risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee. That the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified. That he would rise again on the third day. They had found the empty tomb with the stone that was sealed and it had been rolled away. And the entrance to the tomb was open. And he had risen. He's no longer there. He left his grave clothes there. He's not there anymore and the stone is on. The stone has been moved and he's... Come out of there. In John chapter 20, verse 18, Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. And then she gave them his message. Right, Mary. Yep. Sure thing, you've seen him. Okay. Think about that for a minute. Pause. I saw him. He's alive. 
He's alive. Somebody sit Mary down. I think she needs to sit down. That journey was long for her, and I think she doesn't know what she's talking about. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. He had to say that because they're all freaking out probably because the doors were locked because they were afraid of the Jewish people coming to take them and do to them what they did to Jesus. So they were all in this room and they locked the doors thinking we have to figure out what we're going to do now. And Jesus is all of a sudden just there. Whoop! Where'd he come from? Locked doors. If you're in a house, your doors are all locked, and you know that nobody else is there, and all of a sudden somebody's there. Is the hair on the back of your neck going up? You think you might jump or be startled and peace be with you. That's in today's vernacular. Hey, calm down, settle down, it's okay. It's okay, it's me, it's me, it's Jesus. Can you imagine? There was probably more flies in the room then, too. They probably could have caught a few. Think about that. Think about that. You know, we read the Bible. Oh, that's a good story. Make it real. You're in your house, and all of a sudden, somebody's there. And he's got holes in his hands. She believes it. Ava. He's got holes in his hands. I think you'd be startled. I know I would be. Verse 20. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds of his hands and his side. And they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. And again he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus went to them to prove to them that he had risen and was doing just what he said he would do and that it was a fulfillment of the scripture and the Father's will. And you know what? Jesus is looking for some walls to walk through in our lives today. Jesus is looking to show us that he is alive and by his Holy Spirit doing just as he said he would do for all of his believers By his resurrection, Jesus shows us that he is alive and still doing the unpredictable to accomplish the incredible. In 1 Peter 1.3 that we refer to this many times, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In the Berean Study Bible, it says uh, to us a living hope through the resurrection. And the New Living Translation says, now we live with great expectation. Let's do a vocabulary for one moment. How do we define the word great? An extent, an amount, an intensity considerably above the normal average. And what's an expectation? A strong belief in, in that something will happen or be the case in the future. Wow. Remember I tell you at the beginning of service, I hope you came expecting that something will happen. That something will be achieved. That God has something for you to achieve in your life. That God has something to do for you as you humble, as we humble ourselves before him. Now we live with great expectation, a lively hope, the hope of the resurrection. Jesus is alive. A belief that someone will or should achieve something. Do we believe that? An amen would work. Amen. We won't get into the next probably disappointing when Jesus ascends and then they'll be spittled again because then he ascends and now he's gone. So think about this for a moment. Jesus, he's their friend, he's their mentor, he's their teacher, he's done miracles in front of them. 
He tells them, I'm going to die. I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be betrayed. It, and then it happens, and he, he raises from the dead. Oh, it's like trial, elation. And then he's like, okay, I've been here long enough. It's time for me to go now back to heaven. Oh, again, here we are again. Now he's leaving us again. That's a whole other sermon. But he said, listen, I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is our hope that generates an intense, considerably above normal belief through Christ that we will achieve not only salvation and forgiveness of our sins, but eternal life with him in heaven and everything in between. All that he has promised us, that abundant life. All of that to us until we meet him in the air. There's going to be a meeting in the air in the suite by and by. <laughs> I'm going to say that again. I want you to get that. Sometimes when I put a sentence together, I, it's too many words. But I want you to really catch this as the worship team makes their way up and I'm closing. And everybody said amen, probably. See, I know I get an amen there. <laughs> Might even get some hallelujahs and jumping out of the pew for that. I'll say I'm closing eight times during the sermon. <laughs> well, that, I do, right? You say, oh, yeah, you always do, Pastor. You close ten times. The, res the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is our hope that generates an intense, using great expectation, it's not the book, Great Expectations, but using great expectation as our definition, the resurrection of Christ from the dead is our hope that generates an intense, considerably above normal belief that through Christ we will achieve salvation from our sins, eternal life with him in heaven, and everything in between. All that he has promised us, that abundant life, all of it. To us till we meet him in the air. Jesus, by his life, his death, resurrection from the dead, and ascension to heaven, provides us the very foundation of our hope that Jesus is doing the unpredictable to accomplish the incredible. Who could have devised such a plan? Think about it for a minute. You ever thought about the way God does things and think, my goodness, what in the world was he thinking? We talked about this Christmas time. Think about Jesus being born. Really? The Holy Spirit, no physical, the Holy Spirit impregnates Mary. I think that's unpredictable. That doesn't happen every day. Who would have thought that if it was us, I'm sure, and we were to be in Jesus' place, we would have devised a different way for people to have forgiveness of sins. I'll send my son. He's going to go there. He's going to minister to people. He's going to love on people. He's going to teach them. He's going to perform miracles. He's anointed to preach the gospel, to bring healing to the sick, to set the captive free. Then they're going to turn on him. And they're going to kill him in an inhumane, most excruciating manner. And then to thumb his nose at them, he will come out of the grave that was sealed. And show him and the, them and the devil, death, where is your sting? What is it? Ain't nobody do it like Jesus. And then they're all in a locked room. 
I'm sure he didn't say, watch this. Hey, Father, watch this. Watch. Let's see the look on their face when I walk in there. They're all in there talking. Now remember, they're frantic. They don't know what's going to happen to them, and they got to figure out what they're going to do. And all of a sudden, somebody that wasn't in the room, hey guys, whoa! <laughs> Peace be still. It's okay, it's just me, see? Look, I got the incision. Who would have thought of that? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show them. I'm going to just walk in and I'm not going to use the door or knock on the door. Think of this. And what does all of this mean? You know, let's wrap it up here. What is it we don't understand? We don't understand a lot. We, because I'm included. We have a lot of questions. But because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, he wants to take our fear away. Because I know, I know he holds my future. And life is worth the living because he lives. He sent his son. He bled and died to buy our portion. Like I said, if we were Jesus, I'm sure we would have devised a different way. Yeah, maybe a bull and a goat can do it. Doesn't need to be me. Think about that in humanity. And he still came. It just does not make human sense. We don't love like Jesus loves. We can't because the only way we can is with him in us. And that song is the essence of today's message. Who would have thought? Why did he have to die? So apply that in your life. It may not be a death. It may not be. But apply that in a trial or struggle. Why does it, is this this way? I'm not saying you ask God that. I'm not saying that. I'm saying though, think about that. And secondly, it seems like it just keeps getting worse. But thirdly, the resurrection says it doesn't matter how bad it's getting because someday, at some point, Christ is walking through the wall and he's stepping into the room. And he's saying, peace, it's okay, I'm here now. It's me. Look at my hands. Look at my feet. Look at my side. There's no reason to fear. As I came, I'm sending you now. And of course we know he didn't say to them, go preach now, have fun. It's all you. I'll see you guys later. I'm off to heaven. Have a good time with these people persecuting you. Goodbye. Whoop. No, he said, I'm sending you the Holy Spirit for the power to accomplish what you need. I'm giving you the saws, the hammers, the nails, the screws, and the screwdrivers to do what you need to do. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. How does the resurrection hope speak to us today? He's alive and he's still working. And he wants to walk through some walls in our lives and make a difference in our lives. Would you sing that with me today as we close this service in celebration of his, that Jesus is alive. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. God sent his son.
Sing it with me. Come on now. God said his son. They called him Jesus. He came to heal us. Heal and forgive. He bled and died to us.
Lord, because we serve a risen Savior who is in the world today. Lord, I thank you for your Holy Spirit. Lord, I thank you that you have ministered here today. I pray that we received your message, your word, Lord. That, Lord, we would let it marinate in our lives, Lord, and it would change how we think and how we live our life, Lord, knowing that because you live, we can face that next day and the day after till the day that you come. Lord, I pray now, Lord, a blessing upon your people. Bless them and keep them. May your countenance shine down upon them and give them your peace that passes all understanding. I pray it in the name of Jesus and everybody said, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day today. God bless. Glory to God.